Well, stocks push up with the nifty at fresh all-time highs. IT and telecom and healthcare notch gains, while FMCG metals and financials drag in trade. L&T Technology Services says conversations and pipelines have vastly improved even as it sets a $2 billion medium-term revenue goal. A recovery in BFSI tech spending in the US also prompts a bullish view on LDI mine trade. The National Stock Exchange is set to seek SEBI's no-objection certificate for its proposed IPO after its board cleared the move. The country's largest exchange has over 90% share in equity and derivative segments. The Bitcoin plunges below $60,000 on unlikely leverage-driven liquidation. Ethereum 2 takes a beating. Meanwhile, Nasdaq sees SEC approval to launch Bitcoin index options. Christopher Waller, member U.S. Federal Reserve Board of Governors, bats for same regulation for all players operating in a segment, including fintechs, on integration with the UPI. He says a universal payment system in the U.S. is still a while away. Hello and welcome to Halftime Report on CNBC TV 18. I'm Mikta Batra. With me is Nigel D'Souza. Well, it is celebrations for the market, considering that we are at fresh record highs for the Nifty, with the Nifty, in fact, crossing 25,100 on an intraday basis. Uh, for today, what stands out is that the Nifty IT, the Nifty Pharma Index, and the Nifty Midcap Index, all of them are trading at record highs. We have around 300 plus stocks which are at fresh 52 week highs. Only around 13 stocks which had fresh 52-week lows on the Bombay Stock Exchange. And 55% of all of the stocks which are trading as of now are in the green. So that's what the statistics look like at this point in time. No complaints, Nigel. Well, that's right, Ekta. What a beautiful move, right? 25,000 and counting on the Nifty. We had to wait for a couple of sessions. But today, you know, all through the morning session, I said, I think today is going to be the day. The markets initially in the first half hour, Rod, I was fooled because the markets were down 50 points. But a good recovery is what we're seeing from the day is low. Can we build on from here? That's going to be important. If that has to happen, the Nifty Bank will have to play a role because that plays out the expiry today, the monthly contract and uh, the options data as well will uh, expire today, all the contracts. But let's focus on a couple of stocks. GMM Fordler, well, that stock is firing up. There's a large trade that was seen earlier today. Bamakshi joins us to fill us in with more details. Bamakshi? Well, absolutely. Firing and how uh, we have... Uh... 99.2% equity worth 557 crores uh, changed hands in pre-market block deal window. 41.2 uh, lakh shares uh, changed hands at 1,352 per share. Uh, now keep in mind that over the past one year and in fact on a year-to-date basis, the stock has not done much. Uh, the stock had been trading around the same level as uh, seen a year ago and in fact uh, GMM Fordler declined by almost 6.73% uh, on a year-to-date basis uh, and at the same time Nifty has seen a surge of almost 15 percent. Uh, I would also like to bring to your notice uh, the shareholding pattern of the company as on June 30th. The promoter owns 25 percent stake in the company and there are some notable uh, uh, public shareholders. Geranium Investments Limited holds 8.25 percent stake as per this disclosure. Now keep in mind that this stake was bought earlier from, uh, uh, from uh, Fordler in August 2023 at 1,350 per share. HDFC uh, Mutual Fund owns 4.7 3%, while first centia investor holds nearly 3.2% stake in the company. Now, this block deal has happened, but the buyers and the sellers are not immediately known. We will, of course, have to wait for disclosures to come post-market hours to get more details, but the stock has risen after this block deal. And let me just outline a few possible reasons for the same. If it is indeed the PE investors who own such a large chunk in the company, if they have sold the stake, then the overhang of a large chunk in the future uh, goes away and that is uh, that only holds if uh, the uh, investors who have bought uh, the, this stake are diversified. The company also in the first quarter reported a decent set of numbers. Yes, there was pressure on the margins but the margins were much better as compared to its peers and they were not showing any signs of further degrowth. Diversification strategy has also been adopted by the company and this in turn helped mitigate the slowdown seen in the chemical space and they also focused on newer markets as well as industry sectors. So, given uh, the block deal that has taken place, the stock is still surging higher on the back of these potential reasons. Okay, all right, Vamakshi, thanks very much for that. So, that's on GMM Fordler. 
Well, as of now, we have a very lively market when it comes to the Nifty IT stocks. LTI Mine Tree is your top gainer on the Nifty. It's up around 8 odd percent this week itself, almost 9 percent. Wipro also doing very well today, up around 3 and a half odd percent. Infosys. Uh, Go emphasis up around 2.3 percent. In fact, uh, let's talk a little more about this. We have uh, Rima who's joining in. She's giving us an update with regards to LTI Mind Tree and Tata Alexi, which are in the fo focus on the back of brokerage reports. Thanks so much for that. So let me start with the LTI Mind Tree since that's leading from the front in the large cap space. Kotak today has upgraded LTI Mind Tree to an ad. Their target price stands at 6,200 and their key thesis is that growth rates will accelerate. FY24 was a trough. It picks up to 6.5% dollar revenue growth year on year in the current year and then improved to 11% next year. And the two key impacted verticals, BFSI and high tech, which dragged them down last year, are now now showing signs of recovery. BFSI is already recovering in the United States. Secondly, the other overhang on LTI Mindry with a spate of senior level exits and on that Kotak says that leadership departures have cooled off in the last three to four months. Though they do caution that margin expansion could be limited from here on and whatever little happens is factored in. So according to them, LTI Mindry is a good compounding play, expects strong, consistent EPS growth and they've raised the target multiple on LTI Mind Tree to uh, 28 times. On Tata LXC, Kotak is very bearish. They've always been bearish and they're saying that the stock was expensive to begin with and now even more so after the 26% rally that we had in the stock price in the last two days. Valuations at 61 times a stretch. Uh, valuations at bake in a 20% revenue growth for the company for the next 10 years, FI24 to FI, uh, you know, FI35. And they're saying that while the automotive OEM segment may grow, JLR is doing well, so are the other clients, they're ramping up. But the other portfolio is uh, facing some challenges, whether it's healthcare or media and communication. So Kotak has a sell call and their target price is at 5,500 on Tata LX. Back to you. Okay, all right, uh, Reema, thanks very much for that. So that's on uh, the entire mid-cap IT space and the frontline IT space. We'll take a short break. But up next, we're going to talk about an important trend which is emerging in the US or questions with regards to the US Biosecure Act, its impact uh, that it could possibly have on Indian pharma CDMOs as well as contract research organizations. Stay tuned. Well, the U.S. is currently considering the Biosecure Act, a bill set to prohibit drug manufacturers from purchasing equipment or contracting service from biotechnology companies of concern. This is by 2032. This legislation primarily aims to reduce the reliance on Chinese contract drug manufacturers and research organizations, potentially creating an opportunity for Indian contract drug manufacturers and contract research organizations, namely Loris, Sinjin, Pyramid Pharma, as well as Newland Labs. Ekta is with us to fill us in with all of those details. Ekta, take it away. Thanks for that. Well, at present, due to the Biosecure Act, larger multinational corporations are cautiously exploring ways to diversify their supplier base, which has led to an increase in interest from big pharma in Indian companies. Loris Labs, for example, has observed the beginning of vendor diversification and an uptick in late phase project requests. However, the shift is expected to unfold gradually over a period of time, rather than within a few months or quarters, according to Dr. Chava of Loris Labs, who anticipates that companies will start by handing over small projects with collaborations expanding progressively. Similarly, Pyramal Pharma is experiencing more exploratory discussions, although many of their customers are evaluating options, resulting in inquiries, visits, audits and requests for proposals. No significant decision has been made yet as customers continue to assess their choices. Newland Labs is also engaged in more conversations, customer visits and meetings with US firms, but has yet to see a substantial impact in terms of active requests for proposals. While the company is optimistic about the favorable environment in the medium to long term, it's important to note that Newland is primarily an API company which differs from clinical or biological focused CDMOs. 
Sinjin appears to be gaining more traction, likely due to its existing long-term contracts with multinational corporations, point out analysts. Jonathan Hunt of Sinjin has observed a material shift in big pharma sourcing strategies to mitigate risks. Sinjin, in fact, has indicated that it is participating in pilot projects related to the China switch opportunity and has seen a 50% year-on-year increase in RFPs in, the, in terms of value in the first quarter, its best performance, in fact, in four years. Now, while Indian companies are preparing to seize this opportunity by investing in technology and expanding capacity, there are challenges to overcome. Experts highlight that Indian companies lag behind their global peers in terms of experience, trust, technology, and large molecule capacity. While Indian companies need to enhance their capabilities while competing with uh, US and European firms for the same business. Lastly, a few important points to note. Big Pharma is expected to move more quickly than emerging biotech companies in exploring India as an alternative due to their deeper financial resources. And although the timeline for implementing the Biosecure Act has reduced the urgency for immediate alternatives, the overall trend remains unchanged, signaling a long-term opportunity for Indian contract research and drug manufacturing organizations. Oh. Okay, all right, take that. Thanks a lot uh, for that. Well, uh, I'll tell you what, we'll slip into a short break, but later on we'll continue this discussion about Biosecure Act. We'll be joined by the management of Sinjin International as well as Vishal Manchanda the pharma analyst at Systematics who will be joining in. Stay with us. Welcome back. You're still tuned into Halftime Report. But let's continue our conversation on the U.S. Biosecure Act and what kind of opportunities it could bring up for Indian companies and whether they are tangible or not. To discuss this, we have with us uh, Sibaji Biswas, who's the CFO of Sinjin International, and Vishal Manchanda, who's the pharma analyst at Systematics Group, joining in now. Um, uh, Mr. Uh, Sibaji, as well as Vishal, thank you very much for taking the time out. Uh, well, Mr. S uh, Biswas, you know, if I could just start the conversation with you and ask you about a basic question on whether or not the U.S. Biosecure Act is going to be a tangible opportunity for Indian CDMOs and CROs, or do you think that we just have way too much competition and we're probably lagging behind in terms of R&D as well as capabilities at this point? Um, thanks, Ekta, for the question. I think it's a very tangible opportunity for sure. Uh, you know, today the innovator companies, be it big pharma or biotech, they have a lot of uh, outsourced activity done out of China. And uh, under the Biosecure Act, as you understand, over the next eight years, they have to gradually withdraw and find alternative supply locations. So the act of you know diversifying or de-risking the supply chain has already started. It's a big opportunity because the volume that is currently happening in China is quite huge, many, many times bigger than what happens in India. Now, India has the talent, the infrastructure which can be scaled up, the capital that's coming in, and also you know the expertise to scale up very quickly and capture it. It's also good that there is a six to eight year period because the scale up will happen over that period. So there's no deluge of opportunity that's expected in the next few months. But over the next three to five years, which I say mid to long term, there is a structural advantage that Indian CROs and CDMOs have. And I think uh, the, in the industry is well placed to capture that opportunity. Okay. Well, just to follow up uh, with regards to that, Mr. Biswas, you know, uh, where do you think uh, the slip between the cup and the lip lies for Indian companies? Uh, because there are some skeptics who say that the opportunity might not be as tangible for Indian companies, probably because there is competition which is emerging from uh, US as well as Europe at this point in time, as well as other Southeast Asian countries as well. Say, for example, uh, the Taiwans of the world or the South Koreas of the world. 
So in that context, uh, do you think that our share of incremental revenue or projects would be lesser? Um, I don't think so. And let me explain you why I feel uh, the way I feel. You know, uh, of course, there will be some work that will go back to the Western world. But the cost advantage that, you know, India has and China for, in all probability has offered over a period of time uh, cannot be wished away, right? Plus, India today offers scientific expertise at the level, which is at the global level. So I, I call this an Indian model, right? Get the global level expertise, that quality of science being delivered at India price. That's a too attractive a proposition for the Western world to kind of not turn a blind eye to. So the big opportunity definitely is going to come to India. Now, obviously, some work will go back to US, some work will go back to Europe, and some work will go back to some of the East Asian countries. But the volume and the scale that we are talking about is very big. And there are not many places in this world which can scale up to the extent that is required to, in the next six to eight years, move work out of China and actually make it available uh, to the extent you know, it is required. So I, I am very positive about the train in the next uh, you know, three to five years' time for the Indian CRO CDO industry. Okay, all right, fair enough. Uh, Vishal, what would your view be? Because there is that grandfathering option, uh, you know, which is available where companies don't really need to work on any kind of opportunity till 2032 or the transition is up till 2032. So does that push the can down the road according to you? I think uh, such, a, such an extension was very much required. Uh, it's it's almost impossible to kind of transition your CDMO partner uh, from China to an alternative destination, maybe in the next six months or one year, and that too at a scale at uh, which China is operating. Like if you look at Wuxi alone, my sense is they would have about $6 billion of revenues annually, which is uh, way larger than any Indian uh, CDMO operating. So uh, looking at the scale of uh, the volume that's happening in uh, China and their dependence on US, I think the large part of this revenue that the CDMOs generate in China are coming from the US. So we needed that window. and But we'll start, I think we'll start seeing an impact on the growth rates. Uh, at least the early stage pro projects should start coming into India imminently. And I think what will go to the West is the high value projects and what will come to India imminently would be the high volume projects. So I mean, at least for the high volume projects, wherein you need large tonnages of API, India, uh, the cost advantage is way too high for India. So like the West cannot at all, maybe the West cannot manufacture those products profitably. At the price, the West, uh, the innovator companies would want the, their CDMO partners to manufacture them, manufacture for them. So I think the large volume projects should imminently start coming to India. Okay, so you expect high volume and not really high value projects coming in. And that ties in with the question about our R&D capabilities, whereas we might have the manufacturing capabilities. But uh, Vishal, you know, which are the companies that you think which will be at the forefront to capitalize on this opportunity? So I think the primary names uh, that strike to me is uh, DB's, uh, Suwen, uh, Arti Pharma Labs, Sengin, uh, obviously, which has got one of the best uh, spread in the value chain. They have they are into discovery, they are into manufacturing, they are into biologics, they are into small molecules. Uh, so I think all of these names uh, that uh, come to my mind imminently on who could be the large beneficiaries here. Okay. Well, you know, Newland Labs made some interesting comments. They said that they're getting inquiries, Vishal, but they're not seeing, uh, but one needs to be cognizant of the fact that they are API companies. So how does that tie in in terms of, uh, you know, Newland? Do you think that they'll, they, they might actually not get that incremental uh, order inflow because they're an API company? Make us understand why that's important in the larger scheme of things. I, so my sense is being an API company, there would be some uh, reluctance from an IP standpoint. So uh, companies, the innovator partners become very choosy when they want to outsource the final API to a Indian partner because they, they want protection of their IP around that. And that should not get compromised. So 
innovators are very selective when it comes to outsourcing the API, but they might be more uh, liberal about outs outsourcing the intermediate of a product. So we'll have to see how the situation evolves, how innovators adopt to this. So, but they they need to they need to choose an Indian partner because the West does not have that kind of capacities. Also, they don't have that kind of a uh, kind of a a pool of uh, population to support such kind of uh, last transition that's expected to come. So I think okay. India has to be an option uh, and how the innovator would uh, re respond to the situation in terms of uh, they'll have to kind of... <laughs> Okay. All right. Uh, well, uh, you know, Mr. Biswas, I'm just going to ask you questions with regards to Sinjin and specific now. Uh, you all have mentioned on your conference calls uh, in the past two quarters that, uh, you know, it is a big opportunity for you all. In fact, you all are participating in pilot projects at this point in time. There's a 50% year-on-year -year increase in requests for proposals that you've seen, which is the highest that you've seen in probably four years. Uh, just tell us what is the on-ground situation with Sinjin at this point, the impact of the U.S. Biosecure Act, what are you all seeing on your books right now? Actually, we are very excited, very optimistic about what we are seeing on the ground. Um, the number of inquiries, the, ex ex the exploratory discussions that are happening, the client visit, very high compared to what we have seen in the past. As you have said, RFPs have gone up in the last two quarters, but one should be very clear that, you know, uh, not everybody will just jump into the bandwagon. People will try, test, and then uh, decide on their partners. So we are in that period where we are actually doing pilot projects and exploratory projects. And we believe with the kind of expertise that we have with Sinjin. Sinjin is an integrated uh, you know, business which actually starts from early stage drug discovery and goes up to manufacturing. And we have actually global level capabilities across the value chain. We are very well placed to deliver on these pilot projects. So um, we are very optimistic about the mid to long term. Uh, it will take time. There is nothing which will happen in the next one or two quarters. But over the mid to long term, structurally, I believe we are in a position of an advantage. And Sinjin being the business leader in this space, particularly in the research area, I think we are very, very well placed. Okay, all right, Mr. Biswas, as well as Vishal, we're going to leave it on that note. I'm sure we're going to revisit this discussion many more times as time goes by. Thank you very much for joining in and speaking with us about the U.S. Biosecure Act. Well, we need to, uh, in fact, cut across to Ritu, who is with the management of RBL Bank on the sidelines of the Global Fintech, Fintech Fest. Uh, let's cut in. Fintech Fest, right before it, the big topic of discussion has been the unified lending interface. Just briefly help uh, us understand how it would benefit banks like you and how does it change the lending ecosystem? How I understand it from my, perspe my perspective, I'm just trying to share with you. ULI is going to be a game changer as far as a banker is concerned hmm. for two reasons. Today I get a color kaleidoscopic view of my borrowers are the prospective borrowers. Hmm. This platform may enable us yeah. to get a standardized view and much broader and deeper view of the borrowers existing past transactions mm. that will provide us an insight yeah. second it is going to bring in the digital data hitherto it is in isolations and pockets elsewhere yeah. so when you try to bring all that uh, digital data onto the platform it enable us to make a very informed decision and much more quickly than what we are doing it so it is going to help us two things one are assessing the right sizing or right borrowing uh, ability of the borrower and second, his other transactions with the rest of the financial institutions, which is going to help us out to understand better about his ability and capacity to undertake that particular business. So this will help the banks, in my view, uh, personal view is that it is going to bring uh, them to decide quickly and decide precisely the size of the loan which we wanted to give. So broadly, it will, uh, you know, deepen your, your, or rather strengthen your credit underwriting. But, you know, if you could give us a sense of how much additional credit could this unlock, uh, you know, to the uh, so far unbanked or underbanked sections, the MSMEs, the small rural borrowers. So MSME, if I recall, somewhere in one of the uh, assessments, it has been found. There are 25 lakh crores of uh, the credit is due to that particular segment, yeah. which they are partly being met through unorganized, partly met from uh, borrowings from relatives. And in my understanding, when we get into the field, is that m yeah. most of these MSMEs undertake a transactional based borrowings. Yeah. If we are able to facilitate them to do their, uh, their business based borrowings, mm. so possibly their ability oh. to do more will be.
the standard of uh, business will also go up. So the opportunity is immense. In my view, if you were to put it uh, very sharply, it is going to be a geometrical progression rather than arithmetical progression. Well, uh, sir, a quick word on the business momentum as well. Uh, you know, you have strong NIMS in the quarter, but you know, the fact of the matter is this race for deposit accretion, the higher cost of borrowing perhaps, you know, how will all that play into, you know, how this trajectory will evolve in the future? Do you see, uh, you know, NIMS sustaining at the current levels for uh, RBL Bank? See, as far as our bank is concerned, we were on record. We told that we will be flattish as far as the NIMS is concerned for a couple of quarters okay. because of that uh, uh, the credit card uh, transitional related uh, slippages which we saw it in our book, yeah. which may stabilize and it will normalize after one or two quarters. Thereafter, it will start inching up for the simple reason that uh, our uh, the cost of deposit, no doubt, it is just inching up in, uh, let us say, in single digit and our uh, yield on advances also inching up in double digit. Mm. So the mix of advances, what we are doing it, will be able to sustain this uh, increase sure. in the cost, which will uh, flattish as far as the NIM is concerned and over a period of next couple of quarters, it will start inching up in few uh, mm. uh, few bits thereafter. So uh, on this deposit especially, uh, you know, for RBL Bank, again, it was down sequentially by about 2%. Uh, with the finance minister now also asking banks to come up with more innovative ways for deposit accretion, uh, you know, uh, what sort of strategies do you have in place to, you know, sort of uh, ensure that there is higher deposit growth? What are your targets for the year? See, if you look at that, deposit is for the purpose of deployment. Hmm. When you have a deployment Pretty, thing, yeah. you'll, be, you'll be in a position to get uh, an appropriate uh, deposit mobilization. Hmm. I wanted to look at RBL from a different prism. Okay. Like you look at it. Look at my accretion in less than three crores and less than two crores, which was the earlier one. We have been consistently growing on quarter and quarter every year, around 20, 22 percent and 24 percent, which we have a strong momentum. Our entire DNA has changed from that of the bulk deposit to the granular deposit. Hmm. So the granular, when I, what I mean is all our uh, distribution centers, okay. including my uh, RFL subsidiaries, hmm. they are able to mobilize their customers for a low value, maybe okay. uh, 50 lakhs, 20 lakhs, 10 lakhs, sure. less than two crores. That number is increasing multifold. Hmm. So if I, we are we are confident that we will be able to sustain it because there was a time that on an average we were uh, booking around 600 to 700 crores per month yeah. which went up to 800 crores per month as well mm. and uh, we, are, we are confident that we will be able to maintain that momentum for the two reasons mm. one is our customer service uh, definitely uh, a little little notch up from uh, some of the competitors who have sure. been working with okay. and our rate of interest is also not uh, way away from uh, the competitors okay. Okay, all right. So that is RBL Bank. But on that note, we need to take a short break. Up next, we'll be discussing technicals. Uh, Pratish Mehta will be joining in from Yes Security. Stay tuned. First session for the Bulls, fresh all-time highs holding at 25,100. Where do we go from here? To help us out with that, Pritesh Mehta joins us on the show. Hi, Pritesh. Uh, good day and good to see you in. What's your view? What's the levels you're tracking on the upside? Where does support lie? And fill us in with your picks. So good afternoon, guys. So one thing that you've learned uh, of the last three weeks that our market has been resilient. You know, there had been a plethora of bad news, uh, but market, the decline in the market was short lived and it was forced to bounce back. It is outperforming the Asian markets, it's outperforming the MSCI emerging markets. Apart from that, we have seen various sectors taking leadership. Today is the day of IT. Yes, it is about insurance. And the, before it was, you know, uh, earlier it was about banks and financials. Uh, but at, that's a sign that market's structure is improving. The breadth is improving. When I talk about breadth, I'm talking about Nifty and broader markets. There was a scenario where Nifty 250 small cap index is out of Nifty. So when, you know, when such kind of interest are playing out, uh, I think we are in a sweet, uh, sweet spot. And in, during this kind of scenario, we should not be talking about upset targets. We need to ride that trend. Okay, all right. Uh, what about uh, stocks? So yes, uh, one particular space matters. It has been underperformer. But when you look at the structure, Nifty Metal Index, it has bounced off multiple support zone. And Tata Shield has caught our attention. The stock has made a bullish uh, you know, anchor column. And we are witnessing follow through moves coming in. So we can see a target of 175, 180 on the upside. The stock price would be around 147. The second stock which we like is SBI Life. You know, uh, we have great customers insurance index, and this stock has been outperforming that index. So from here on, you know, uh, we can see a rally towards 2100, and the stock would be at a 1780. 
Okay, all right, Pratesh, thanks a lot uh, for that. Well, for the time being, we'll slip in a short break. On the other side, we'll get an exclusive conversation with Christopher Waller. Stay with us. Welcome back. Well, let's see whether the Bank Nifty breaks into the green, just about lower by around 54 odd points at this point in time. Uh, but in terms of losers for uh, the Nifty stocks, we have Hero Moto, which is down around 1.4% at this point. We have Asian Pains, which is sulking a bit, along with Britannia. So a couple of these FMCG and consumer-related stocks, such as Autos, is seeing some amount of pressure at this point in time. Uh, otherwise, uh, it's turning out to be a good session for a couple of the... Um, stocks on the upside, NBCC, for example, is seeing a lot of volume and price action today. So that stock is up around 16 odd percent. I uh, just want to point out that overall for the Nifty as well, it's given up a, a little bit of its highs from a little bit of its gains from the day's high, but still holding at record highs or holding above the previous record high at least. So 25,096 odd is currently where the Nifty is at. The momentum continues. Mid-cap index has shaved off a little bit, so it's just about flattened out, so down up around 70-odd points as we speak for the mid-cap index. Trent continues to go from strength to strength, so Trent is up around 3.8% today as well. That stock is now currently at around over 7,130-odd rupees, up around 133% this year. Well, on the sidelines of the ongoing Global Fintech Fest, our colleague Ritu Singh exclusively got up with uh, Christopher Waller, who is a member of the U.S. Fed Reserve Board of Governors, and discussed the banking crisis in the U.S. Fin Fintech, UPI linkage, and more. Listen in. I just wanted to understand the kind of interactions that you've been having with the payment players here. You know, what are the sort of technologies you've been most excited about? And, you know, what did you take away uh, from your trip here so far? Yeah, so the main reason I came here was to learn more about uh, UPI and the payment system and the payments landscape in India, yeah. which I've heard a lot about since I took over as overseeing the payment system for the U.S. Yeah. Uh, so it's been great to kind of understand how it started, what the technology stack is, how it's been developed, how they've got everybody involved, and just basically how to improve the digital payment system. And it's been an amazing success. Mm. Uh, I've also learned sort of the things that would be very hard for us to try to do in the United States, just yeah. different constraints, both politically, privacy, and things like that. Mm. But nevertheless, it helps me go back and think about how we could move things forward in the U.S. Well, you spoke a lot about interlinkages between the fast payment systems here in India. Of course, we've had the UPI, and we've had several bilateral agreements with various countries for those kind of linkages. How soon before we hear something with the U.S.? Well, like I said, we can do interlinking, but our system isn't developed yet. So mm. you're going to connect. It's a bridge to nowhere <laughs> because nothing's going to move until we get our system completely built up. So that's that's what I try to communicate, that it's going to take us another couple of years to fully expand our system mm. so that if you want to send a payment from India to anywhere in the U.S., mm. it'll get there or mm. vice versa. But yeah. we're not there yet. So yeah. this is just a matter of building out our network and when it's big enough and it's broad enough, then interlinking would be a serious value proposition. Well, you know, you heard the uh, Economic Secretary and the uh, Ministry of External Affairs earlier talking about how India has been a rule abider so far, but perhaps it can be a rule maker. Uh, when you talk about the fintech innovations, perhaps in that theme, uh, you know, uh, with the kind of technology India has built with fast payments, uh, are you looking at some sort of technology transfer, some sort of partnership to build uh, your fast payment ecosystem back in the U.S.? Yeah, I mean, the technology part of interlinking is actually the easiest part. Yeah. The hard part is the legal, the governance, rulemaking, and that requires people to sit down in a room and agree on the way things are going to get done. Yeah. So that's not a technology problem. The technology part is actually fairly easy to do. Yeah. So anyway, that's, that's where things would have to then move, is how do we agree to do the governance processing. Clearing and settlement of international payments is not a trivial yeah. problem and how that would be done and what exchange rates you would do that at. So that's stuff that would have to be settled on. And that might, that actually, we know from experience with our own uh, ACH that that takes a while to get that done. Mm. 
Uh, Governor, if I may get a word in on the health of the U.S. Uh, financial banking system, you know, since the crisis, of course, last year, uh, you know, now, uh, you know, do, do you see any risks uh, building up? You know, uh, what is your overall uh, sort of assessment of the financial ecosystem? Uh, we, you know, we had a banking crisis in March of 23. Yeah. The Federal Reserve stepped in, set up our lending facilities to make sure that the liquidity and everything, and that has calmed down, and we were able to close that facility in March of this year. Yeah. So. That's our confidence that everything in the banking system is fine. Welcome back, and the focus is on sugar this time around. And to talk on that, we are now joined by Mr. Praful Vitlani. He is chairman at All India Sugar Trade Association. Mr. Vitlani, hi. Thank you so much for joining us. And first of all, on the international markets, because that is where the major price move seems to be happening, from a low of almost 17.5 to 19.7 in matter of days and less than a week has been nothing short of a huge short covering. We've seen Brazil at the center of this with the kind of wildfires and expectation that 5 million tons of cane perhaps has gotten destroyed there. What's your sense on the international market's availability and prices? Yeah, this uh, repeat of story of 2017-18 in Brazil. And uh, physically, really, we see this year there cannot be more loss than of 1 million metric ton of sugar from Brazil. The, what the concerns are for the next season that due to dryness, uh, there could be uh, less sucrose available in sugarcane in Brazil next year. And it's very difficult to say now that uh, how much loss will be in the next season. But I can predict that now uh, March and May month, uh, pricing can go towards the north or northwards and uh, sucrose will be found less in next year. We The sugar mix, which was expected around 52 uh, percentage, is can come down to 50 percentage and uh, the eyes will be on India that whether government of India will allow any export or not and if allow when suppose it allows after March then it there will be no raw sugar only white sugar export will be there so particularly NIBOT is going to be very active in the world and this uh, panic is due to uh, both the things that Brazil uh, will have less production in next year, whereas uh, India uh, is not there for supply because the government of India is more looking towards the having maximum ethanol production after the domestic consumption requirement of sugar. Sure. So, uh, I'll come to India, but before that, the kind of moves that we have seen in the international markets, Mr. Vitlani, haven't had much of an impact in the Indian prices, Indian sugar stocks for that matter. Would you say that at this point in time, we are pretty isolated with what's happening, isolated from what's happening in the international markets? We are in a house arrest. No. We have all regulations. We cannot sell more than what is allowed. We cannot sell less what is allowed by the industry. And regulated things, India price cannot go up, though Brazil can go up. And uh, we we are fully, uh, almost fully uh, regulated that how much we can trade us, you know, also have some, uh, give the, uh, how much stock they have every month. So very much regularized to the traders as well as the industry, that industry can sell not more than this. And day by day regulations are going ahead. So... Supply will be, and we are having, according to us, is around 7.5 million metric ton closing stock for uh, 202324. So it is more than 1.5 million metric ton than what it is regularly required. So I don't think that India price can go up. So going forward, especially for the Indian markets itself, are you looking at any restrictions being eased at all? Yes, I do. But that is only for the ethanol. What I am looking after is that uh, ethanol blending uh, from sugarcane juice will be allowed uh, from 1st of November itself. Maybe 
uh, it could be in three installment with starting of 2 million metric ton initially and as the season progress and what is the production likely to be get clear because anything we predict currently uh, that is subject to error of 10 to 15 percentage but in january it get clear with error of only four five percentage so maybe they start initial one stage of 2 million metric ton then maybe next 1.5 next 1.5 can be go to 5 million metric ton, but it will be first of all for ethanol after domestic. Ethanol pricing, yes, we are looking very much positive that by in month of October, there could be some six to eight percentage price increment of procurement of ethanol from sugar cane juice uh, by OMC. That is also looks like on the board. So whatever positiveness okay. are likely to come, that's in ethanol. All right. Also, my final question, really, on uh, you know, we are at the cusp of the festival season now, and the demand has already begun. What's your sense for the month of September in sense of quota that the government could come with, and are you looking at a very significant increase in sugar consumption from India? Yeah. Uh, see, uh, the September quota is also government will give slightly higher. This is what uh, experience of my four decades says, because when the food index goes up, the government control is only on sugar. Hmm. So sugar get penalized because of other commodity price goes up, inflation. But sugar, uh, I don't think uh, that any low quota can come for the September, but not higher also because government is already giving a signal that last month they have given, uh, you know, uh, extension for the month of uh, last month. So mm -hmm. they look at looking after they are comfortable at today's price. Okay. They, are not, they are not interested to price to go down as such, but looks like to be a stability. Point taken. Mr. Vitlani, as always, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for talking about the international markets, Indian festival demand, and of course, uh, ethanol policy restrictions, which perhaps are in the coming. But with that, that's all the time on this show. Business Lunch will take all the action ahead.